Dr. <laughs> Casey. So nice to meet you. Uh, thank you. You too. Thanks okay, I think this me. is working out really well going side by side. I can see you just fine. Yeah. Can you see me okay? Okay. Yeah. Good. So let me uh, make sure that I'm pronouncing your last name correctly. Danit Howard? Yeah. Okay, good. Excellent. Well, I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to share with us about the pelvic floor and hip pain. Um, I connected with you maybe a month or two ago on Instagram when you had a really good post on uh, hip stabilization exercises and hip pain. And so I thought, wow, I, a lot of my friends and followers here, I think, would benefit from your information. So Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that post, people like the videos of this. Oh, there's my cat. <laughs> oh, um, <no. laughs> uh, people like the posts of the videos of the exercises, I think, because it, they're really tangible and they can practice them at home. Yeah. So, yeah, um, exactly. yeah, happy to talk all things hip. And I know we spoke about maybe isolating the obturator internus as mm -hmm. a kind of common culprit for some hip yes. pain. So, yes. Good. So before we get started on the clinical side of things, tell us a little bit about yourself. I understand you have a private practice called Enlightened PT. So a little bit of your professional background and where you are, too. Okay, so I'm in Santa Monica, California. I um, own my practice. I'm the only PT there right now. Okay. Although we might be going soon. Thank you. Um, I see men and women with pelvic floor dysfunction of all kinds. So traditionally, that's the peeing, pooping, having sex right. issues. Um, but I also, my background is in orthopedics. I was an orthopedic physical therapist for before I, for three or four years before I started specializing. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, in, in pelvic health specifically. And then I did all my pelvic health education through the Herman and Wallace um, group, which I now assist for. Um, so that's kind of the private practice. And, and then the, the other side of my business is that I host workshops and retreats that are wellness based and often yoga based approaches to pelvic health. Uh, okay. So that's kind of my more, um, the way of working in community rather than just one on one. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. I'd love to hear more about that sometime, too. That sounds yeah. intriguing. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> so let's just jump into hip pain in the pelvic floor. So what does hip pain have to do with the pelvic floor? <laughs> <laughs> really good question. I mean, we, we think of, I think, even in PT school, we thought of those those two areas as very separate areas. But the pelvic floor is within the pelvic girdle and the hip joint is part of that system. Yes. Yes. And um, I think oftentimes because people don't really know their own anatomy or know a good way to talk about their bodies, a lot gets thrown in the idea of hip pain. So that could mean a lot of things. It could mean, anterior kind of front hip impingement it could mean side of the hip gluteus medius pain it could mean sciatic sij mm -hmm. issues mm -hmm. so it's there's a huge broad scope of of diagnoses and types of complaints that patients or just people might have right. in general and with that comes a lot of confusion. <laughs> yeah, like what, where, I'm having these symptoms, where are they coming from, and who can help me? I mean, that's really what people want, is I want to get helped, right? I don't want to have pain. So, right. So we're um, and so, to identify some things here. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I think, honestly, I think the best place to look is the anatomy first, um, because, and and then in terms of who to see, I end up, because of my specialty, I end up seeing people who've kind of failed traditional physical therapy. They've mm -hmm. gone to their orthopedic person and they've gone to acupuncture and their ortho, maybe even they've had surgery for like a labral tear or something like that. But, and not to say anything bad about those, those right. they uh, help practitioners at all. Mm -hmm. Sometimes though, if we're not even looking at the source, which can be inside the pelvic bowl, 
um, like the operator does start, like it's just that they're not seeing it. And right. unfortunately, the education about this area of our body isn't always there for a lot of practitioners. Yeah. So um, I do have my pelvic model if you oh, want to go through yes. it. Yeah, please, please give us a okay. little anatomy. Yeah, so it's important to know the bones. We have our ileums on the side, the pubic um, bones meet at the front. Um, there's actually a joint here called the pubic symphysis. And then the ischium are kind of our sitting bones. And so I think sometimes people think the pelvis is really upright like this. But in fact, in a human body, it's actually angled forward a bit more. And from the back, you can see that we have the sacrum and the coccyx, the tailbone. My poor pelvis has been through the ringer, so there's some, <laughs> some muscles and ligaments out of, out of whack, but kind of like real in real life. Right, exactly. Um, None of us are perfect. So, yeah. The pelvic bowl and the pelvic floor often refers to this main group of deep muscles that you can see, which um, usually we call the levator ani. Um, it's a collection of a few specific muscles that we can or cannot go into today, depending on time. Um, but an important part, and I don't know if this is, is it bright enough over yeah, here yeah, for you to see? see? Okay. Fine. Okay. Um, from the like front side wall, and then from the front here, you can see this kind of fan of muscles or of, of one muscle. It's like mm -hmm. a sheet. And it's, I like to think of it as the front side window, and that's your obturator internus. And the obturator internus is a very unique muscle because it actually makes a 90 degree loop around the sitting bone. And then here's the acetabulum where the femur sits. Uh -huh. So it'll connect right to the outside of the femur. And so its action is to pull the femur back and rotating. So an externally rotation, external rotation. Mm -hmm. But the bulk of the muscle actually is within the deep pelvic oh, bowl. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. So it's not something you can, it's not something that people can just feel on the outside of their pelvis. It's a well, special it, skill to be able to palpate that. on the Yeah. Inside. And mm -hmm. so say I have a patient in sideline and I was just doing an orthopedic exam and I wasn't doing an internal exam. I could technically mm -hmm. kind of nestle my fingers in this space. Yes. And then up and along. But that's more just the like tendon -y, very small part of the obturator. Oftentimes, the origin of tension and pain is actually more in the bulkier part, which lies within the bowl, which requires an internal mm -hmm. um, exam. And then just one more example I have of that is on this really cool app. Do you have the Essential Anatomy app? I don't have the Essential Anatomy. I have the Human Anatomy. Okay. So basically you can see from there, and Very then if we cool. turn them around, how it comes out it. like that. Yes. And I like a this. picture is worth a thousand words. Really. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. This diagram is cool, too, because it shows the piriformis, um, which is just above the obturator. So it's nice to know where, where we're talking in terms of location. Very beautiful. Thank you yeah. for that. Thank you. Of for course. That. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, what are some common misdiagnoses when it comes to pelvic girdle, hip, or low back pain? that could benefit from a pelvic. So how would people know, uh, you know, I could benefit from a pelvic health assessment? Yeah, I mean, the, the first thing is definitely, like if you're in traditional physical therapy and something's not quite getting you all the way there, there is probably a missing link. And yeah. that link might be looking internally to the pelvic floor for trigger points within the obturator muscle or anywhere else within the yeah. pelvic bowl, actually. Um, but so, so hip common pain, so hip pain would be a big one. Like, yeah, you're still you're in therapy for hip pain. And it's just maybe you've improved, maybe you haven't, but you're not getting to where you want to be. Right. So mm -hmm. within that blanket of hip pain, um, impingement is a common kind of and none of these are necessarily isolated. Two right. things or three things might be happening. Right. Um, the obturator has a very specific referral pattern with um, kind of 
uh, with if there's a trigger point, the referral pattern is commonly down the leg, um, down the back of the leg. So oftentimes people are misdiagnosed with sciatica or piriformis syndrome because that also kind of follows that nerve pathway that of the sciatic nerve and a kind of a typical complaint good, like that. Um, SIJ dysfunction, um, even low back pain. Um, I think that I often see people, I saw one question that you sent me earlier mm -hmm. that ties in with knee pain. Yes. Cer certainly that can be a case, especially with someone who's really active, uh, more on the athletic side, like a runner, or um, I see a lot of people who have done CrossFit and cross training and that sort of thing. So that's a common area as well. Good. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. So why do you think that piriformis syndrome and sciatic sciatica get confused a lot with the obturator internus because of that pathway i think those very similar maps of the referral patterns i i think i was able to find one of those two just to give a visual um yeah so the red is like the a Ooh. main referral pattern and then the like kind of spotty or red shadow down the leg is is also the that referral um, map. And, and, that's the, and that's obturator internus, what you just yes, showed us, right? Yes, specifically for the obturator internus. Good. So I think just anatomically location, it's all, I mean, it seems maybe like very clear cut and dry in, um, in a, <laughs> in a model like this, <laughs> but it's actually not a very big area at all. And all of these external hip muscles, um, not even taking into account the pelvic bowl, they're all so close together. And what's really important and I, what I what fascinates me is that the fascial component of all of this. So sure, we could really tease out there's a trigger point in this muscle and that's the problem. But I just don't think that's a very um, holistic or true way of looking at things. The whole system is encased in this multi-dimensional network of tissue called the fascia yeah. and that's where we get referral patterns and and it's all connected yeah. so for those of you that may not be familiar with what fascia is i like to explain it that it's kind of like a spider web so it's yeah. a thin layer and it's wrapped all around your muscles and your tissue and it connects all your all your internal structures basically so if you have uh inflammation or you have any kind of issue whether it be um an, an incision or some kind of injury in one area it can also pull in another area so in in theory if you had um a c-section scar and you could actually have referred pain down the leg from a C-section scar because of that fascial component. So I think that's so important and uh, we don't talk about it enough. So yeah. thank you for bringing that up. Of course, yeah. I, I always describe it as a multi-dimensional fishnet stocking. And then when things go wrong, it's like someone took a saran wrap and like Ooh, that's suctioned nice. around its structures. Nice, that's a good yeah. analogy too. Because we want to try to make it you know, user friendly and practical for people to understand. Definitely. <laughs> okay, so we talked about that you can have multiple dysfunctions at the same time. So you can have a hip issue and pelvic floor also be involved and maybe low back pain. These things can coexist. Now tell me, how can we prevent problems in the first place? So what are some prevention things that you would recommend? Yeah, so that definitely comes into the need for being strong and also mobile. So while we're on the topic of fascia, there's lots of ways to mobilize the fascia. Um, there's foam rolling. There's, uh, I really like Jill Miller's The Roll Method. I just went to a whole workshop with her. Okay. That was great. Um, there's all sorts of tools and massage te and manual therapy techniques that you can do to keep the fascia mobile. So that's one piece of it is just to keep everything gliding and sliding and moving well. However, the pelvis is such a central part of our body. It's where load is transferred constantly all day long and then add in anything more vigorous than standing really requires a lot of dynamic coordination right. of how the core, meaning the four layers of abdominal muscles, the diaphragm on the top, the pelvic floor on the bottom, and then the hip girdle muscles and how 
all of those muscles are coordinating with each other to maintain stability. So you could actually have really strong glutes, a great glute max, nice perky bubble butt. <laughs> <laughs> nice. But may, maybe your gluteus medius isn't yeah. turning on when it's supposed to. It could be very strong if your therapist is pushing down on it. But if it's not working for you or stabilizing, it's really yeah, not it doing its to job. to do the right thing at the right time. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I guess a um, little more concise answer to that would be it's important to have transverse abdominis coordination with pelvic floor activation with gluteus medius and maximus coordination. Um, because oftentimes the, the obturator kicks on, in my experience, when all those muscle up. Uh, all those other muscles aren't really doing their job as well as they should and be. And it's trying to help. Yeah, and it's a little muscle. <laughs> it's a little muscle. Yes, good, good. Okay, so we're going to jump into some of the sticker questions now, all right? Uh, there are some that really weren't too much related to uh, the hip. So I'm going to save those towards the end because we have a limited time. I'm going to uh, jump into the ones that specifically deal with the hip and the pelvis first. Sure. So my hip swells usually more after exercise. Why? I mean, there could be so many reasons why, but one of them could potentially be what you were just describing, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think how strong are you? How well are all those muscles coordination, coordinating? What kind of exercise are you doing? Because definitely, you know, even instruction within a CrossFit kind of um, setting might not, you might not be doing the exercises that are appropriate for you. Right. Um, there might be some arthritic changes, you know, we don't, we don't know what's happening at the level of the bone. Um, so it, that's a really hard question to answer without doing a full evaluation right. and look, looking right. at someone's range of motion. And how they're moving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Good. Okay, so another one, sleeping on the right side causes pain in the right testicle in the same ways for the left. Do you think this could be due to the hip or, you know, what I'm thinking is maybe the fascial component? Do you have anything to add to that one? Yeah, I, I would want to know if the per so I usually have, ask more questions. Before I have questions an you, guys, you know, we have <laughs> and we usually have the person so we can dialogue yeah. back and forth. Yeah. So this so, is just we're not and by the way, we're not giving medical advice. Yeah. This is just general information and we want you to see a provider. Yes, exactly. My initial thoughts are, what are you, are you sleeping with your pelvis misaligned? Are you on your side and kind of tilted one direction? So perhaps you're straining and causing tugging and pulling within the fascial system. Um, or is there another inflammatory process happening within the hip joint maybe or the SI joint that when you lay asymmetrically that things are, um, creating oh, an inflammatory yeah. response and causing uh, maybe even nerve tensioning and yeah. nerve referral pain to the testicle. It depends on the quality of pain. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, so what exercises or movements would you recommend that people avoid if they have hypermobile hips and also pain with intercourse? Interesting. <laughs> I know. So we want stability. Yeah. So I, I think that actually that series that I showed that you originally uh -huh. contacted me about, yeah. those were all those isometric. Mm -hmm. And so I would actually, if you're hyper mobile, you want to stay within a contained range of motion. Mm -hmm. um, I deal with, the, with a lot of this in the like yogi world. Everyone's super flexy bendy and going to the extremes. But actually, the important thing is to bring come into to the stable center place. Um, so that would be my my recommendation for that. And then in terms of pain with sex, you want to be careful if there's if you're hypermobile in the hips, there's probably some resulting tension and holding within the pelvic bowl, right. which might be causing to stabilize. Yes. Mm -hmm which might be causing some pain with attempts at insertion. I don't know the type of pain with sex that this person's having, but if there's tension and holding within the pelvic bowl, that could cause pain with insertion. 
So you want to focus more on softening the deep core when you're actually having intercourse. Excellent. Uh, what would be some of your tips for calming an overactive obturator internus muscle? Getting in position that can allow it to soften. Um, there are definitely, you know, I'm a physical therapist, so I do the manual therapy techniques internally and externally to release the, the obturator. And I will say it's usually not a one and done kind right. of deal. Um, but I usually have my patients follow up with using a ball. Um, I don't know that I have one easily accessible, but, you know, like a, a tennis ball or a lacrosse mm -hmm. ball sized um, ball is great to basically work all around the sacrum, all around the gluteus uh, muscles, the deep layers. And then specifically for the obturator, if the femur is right here in the socket, to really use the ball to almost like feel like you're like creating space right behind the femur where all of the piriformis and uh, rot hip, little hip rotators connect. Yeah, and you'll feel it really dense. You feel a lot of density yeah. right in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think those are the, a good one. And then also like uh, poses like child's pose or happy baby, as long as you're really supported, um, like you're not straining to be in that position, maybe you're using pillows or straps or something, that can allow the whole pelvic floor to turn off as well. I like it. Good. good. So how closely related is pelvic floor dysfunction to hip dysfunction so you know that's a that's a pretty broad question yeah <laughs> i think we've touched on a lot yeah. of how it could possibly yeah. be together and i don't know that we have any statistics to say this percentage of people with pelvic floor have you know coexisting hip dysfunction but going back to what we were saying initially if you're having continuing hip dysfunction, pain, loss of mobility, whatever it is, uh, and you're not getting the outcomes that you want, think broader. So think, yes. is the pelvic floor involved? Do we have this obturator internus muscle potentially um, flared up? Yeah, and I just as a quick side note, I do I have a resource on my website, and I'm seeing a lot of my other colleagues coming out with resources about like what a pelvic floor PT visit actually is, because it can mm -hmm. kind of sound scary. Yeah. So I can refer my, pay, my you know, your watchers to my website yeah. for that. But also, mm -hmm. um, I think that you've talked a little bit about that on your channel as yeah. well at some point too. Yeah. So is it enlightenedpc.com? It's actually Casey, C-A-S-I-E, D-P-T dot com. Okay, good. And I'll, yeah. um, I'll share that in my story, too, if, if you guys didn't catch okay. it. Okay. Okay. So this question, uh, she gave birth sideline, and she's had pelvic floor dysfunction since. And so is there anything to do with the hip with that, do you think? That definitely, definitely could be. I mean, r my initial thought is side lying is actually a, an underused and pretty good position to have um, a delivery in. But there could be nerves that are tensioned. There could have definitely been like an elbow that hit something on the way out. Um, I would for sure, I mean, with any postpartum mom, I would recommend getting a pelvic floor yeah. checkup. Yes. not just from your gynecologist at that six week mark. Mm -hmm. Good. I agree. There is a question within the story here, wanting us to talk a little bit more about the external release for the obturator internist. So do you mind just showing on your pelvis again? I, sure. you know, as a therapist, I can do that. I don't, I don't know about doing that to yourself. You know, have you ever tried to do that? That would be, really tough. I mean, I know exactly where this is on my body and it is very hard for me to get into this area. Um, I've used a small ball to get in there, but you want to be really, really sure that that's the, the source the right of your pain yeah. because there's also a very important nerve that comes right out through this little canal called the pudendal nerve. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to be sitting on it for very long. You don't want to be provoking it. Um, and I would stick to the releases more along the, the um, juicier part of the yeah. glutes 
yeah. um, where there's more cushion away from those really sensitive nerves. Yeah. Um, I teach my patients how to do their own very specific internal releases, either with their thumb or internally the thumb. along the front wall or with a wand, mm -hmm. like a, a treatment yeah. wand. So I, I completely agree with, with what you're saying there. So with that uh, obturator internist, we really would suggest that you get a provider that is skilled and then being able to give you feedback for your body and making sure that you're doing it right. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and, and I will say orthopedic physical therapists should be able to do some treatment where they are in that little space. So, you know, always need the internal work but and even if they can do an exam to just say like oh yeah that's tender you should probably yeah. get that looked yeah. at more exactly Good. yeah okay uh pelvic girdle pain so what are some of your suggestions for that i think it goes along with a lot of what we've already talked about Absolutely. stability is really important um if you if you're having like SI dysfunction where there's a lot of movement around, like say if you just had a baby or something like that, yeah. sometimes mm -hmm. it's nice to use a belt to actually provide some external stability, mm -hmm. which then can set yourself up for just being in a more contained position so that your muscles aren't having to do so much of the small stabilizer work um, throughout your day with your functional movements. Yeah. I would say one thing, too, that I've seen quite a bit with pelvic girdle pain is that people may buy their own belt and apply it and use it. And sometimes their pain increases. And so they're like, yes, I tried the belt and it doesn't work. But if you have, so you have that, your pelvis, I don't have a pelvis in front of me, but if yeah. the pelvis is rotated at all, so you have that one choice, way. And if you're compressing a pelvis that is not in good alignment, that can be very painful. So uh, if you're on your own and you're trying to belt for pelvic girdle pain and it hasn't been successful, go see a provider, a pelvic therapist, or even an orthotherapist that can help to look at your pelvis and see what's going on there and make sure that you're in a good position. Yeah, completely agree. And make sure the belt is in the right position, too. <laughs> and that it's the right kind of belt, that it's the enough yeah. support, but not too rigid, too. Okay, um, we have just one or two more questions. Are there specific movement patterns we can look for that can lead us to identify obturator internist being possible to dis uh, dysfunction? So, so if somebody is doing X, Y, or Z, what would lead you to think that it may be obturator? Um, and I'm assuming this might be coming from a therapist. I'm not I sure. I think so too. But a I'm lot sure. of a lot of the things that I look for. For you now, you are yes. Okay, okay. Um, I think that looking for the Trendelenburg sign with movement. Um, walking, running. You know, if you're seeing that opposite level hip drop, there's probably some instability happening ha happening within those movements and then I always really like to watch how people are squatting and doing single leg squats and balancing and how the femur is tracking within that so if it's dipping inwards if it's going into dynamic valgus okay. um, the gluteus medius and the hip rotator muscles probably aren't doing their job to, to keep the femur in line in a single leg squat um, so those are kind of like my external things. And then if they have pain with resisted hip external rotation, since the obturator is a hip external rotator, that might tell me that there's a trigger point within that muscle. Mm -hmm. Good. Yes. So similar to glute medius weakness. So the glute gluteus medius weakness is playing into potentially the obturator having issues. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. And then we had a comment here, some providers aren't very smart, and it's hard to find a competent one. <laughs> well, so, <laughs> um, so we, it is important uh, to find, you know, a good provider that you trust, just like a haircut, right? So there might be some that you do well with and some that maybe not so good. But overall, I think most providers are in it to help people. And maybe they haven't been exposed to the tools uh, or gone, you know. So if you're a provider out there and you're having people that, you, you know, with hip pain that you just haven't been able to get over that last hurdle, 
think about obturator and turnus, think about the pelvic floor and, yeah. and work with a pelvic therapist that can, you know, co-treat or, or uh, you know, you can complement each other. And ask questions. I think the best, the best thing you can find in a provider is someone who can say, actually, I'm not sure. Let me look that up or let me ask my colleagues. Yeah. Like, we don't know everything. Yeah. <laughs> and the person that thinks they do, that's a scary place to be in. Right. <laughs> yeah. Good. So we're going to wrap up. Is there anything that you'd like to share with the audience before we depart? Um, I mean, I, I can't, I cannot overstate how important I feel like postnatal pelvic floor PT visits are. Um, for wellness. I mean, in many countries, like in France, they're automatically included um, within the healthcare system. And so I think that's a, a really underserved, overlooked community. And, and even though we often think of pelvic floor weakness after birth, we can have these tension issues. We can have the imbalance issues. I mean, that's nine months of carrying a very, very heavy load. It's expected yes. that... Yes certain areas of the pelvis are going to be out of whack after that happens, yes. not to mention the delivery, whether it's vaginal or with the C-section. Yes. Um, so that is kind of my takeaway point, I think, mm -hmm. um, for today. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. Well, let's definitely do this again. You guys make sure you check out her account on Instagram. It's at enlightened PT. She has some great demonstrations of different hip exercises and, and she has a fun personality. So I think you like following <laughs> her. Um, also the website, which I'll link to this, this video will be available on my story for 24 hours. We're going to save it and then we will upload it to YouTube within a few weeks. And so that'll be accessible there too. So I think it worked out great being horizontal like this. I wasn't sure. How yeah. I, was. I tilted my head a little bit to read. But. <laughs> okay. So thank you so much again for your time. Have a great day. And thank you guys for joining us. Take yeah. Care. Thank you. I'll see you later. Uh, <laughs> Bye. Bye.